I'd really like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and putting on this session. Uh, a year ago, almost to the day, we were in the lab taking our final data for this Bell experiment. And so um, at that point, it was very exciting. There's a lot of adrenaline and um, taken a while to kind of come down off of that. And I'm almost fully recovered from that experiment. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here a year later. And in fact, uh, today, I'm not only just going to talk about our loophole-free Bell test, but because we're at QCrypt, I thought it would be interesting to a number of you to talk about our efforts towards a device-independent um, random number generator. Who's interested in that at NIST. Now, uh, the other reason I really enjoy being at QCrypt is that so many of my collaborators who are normally non-local um, are actually here. So I see uh, Ikai, I don't know if Stephen Jordan's here, and Josh Beanfang, um, also Paul, and um, Thomas, Thomas Yenavine as well. And uh, this experiment would not have been possible without the help of so many um, co-authors that brought different expertise to make this happen. And in particular, I'd like to point out the contributions of some students. So Thomas Yenavine's Evan Meyer Scott, who came down and helped us um, with a lot of our source development. And then Paul sent Brad Christensen and uh, Michael Allen Wayne, who came in and uh, really helped take a lot of our data and kind of get this experiment across the finish line. But I'm also going to be talking today about, we've added some more co-authors uh, for a second, this kind of randomness extraction, um, part of our experiment. And uh, this work has mainly been done, the theory contributions by Peter Beerhorst. Peter's going to be giving the theory talk, the theory version of the talk tomorrow in the Hot Topic session. And I highly recommend you go and check it out because he's going to go into a lot more detail about the nuts and bolts of how this protocol works. I'm going to be giving you the hand-waving physics version of that. Um, I learned a long time ago that when a physicist says that A equals B, it does not mean the same thing when a mathematician says A. So if you want the rigorous version, you should go and talk to Peter. So at NIST, we, we have a, a randomness beacon. You can go check it out. It's, it's live on the web. And what happens is every minute, it broadcasts a series of 512 random bits. And these random bits, you can go and um, cryptographically verify that it comes from NIST, and there's a whole blockchain associated. And it's useful for a public source of randomness. But with this project, we started asking the question, what's the best you can do for a random number generator? And it appears that with a loophole-free Bell test, that is the best random number generator that nature could, in principle, allow you to um, produce. And so we started an effort towards investigating this because um, in our name, it's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we get kind of obsessed with the standards issue. We want to know how good is the randomness that we're producing? Is there a way that we can certify this? And so that began our effort towards a loophole-free Bell test. So in a loophole-free Bell test, what are we testing? We're testing this notion that's sometimes called local realism. And I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, I haven't apparently learned Ronald's example of quoting famous physicists. Um, so you're going to get a couple of quotes throughout my talk. I apologize in advance. Uh, the first comes from Laplace. And he's got this wonderful philosophical essay on probabilities he writes in, in 1814. And at the intro of this, this book, he says, the curve described by a simple molecule of air or vapor is regulated in a manner just as certain as the planetary orbits. The only difference between them is that which comes from our ignorance. In other words, if I, if I had a box of molecules, of, of, of gas molecules, and I knew the position and momentum, the starting conditions of, of each of those gas molecules, I could write down the equations of motion, and I could exactly predict how that system would behave. And Turns out, with quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics is a statistical theory. You deal in probabilities. And so it was thought that maybe the same thing's happening here, that underlying all of quantum mechanics, there's really uh, something that regulates it, these variables that regulate it. They might be hidden from us, but if we could access them, then everything would come back and we could exactly know with certainty what's going to happen. But we can't do that because they're hidden from us, so we have to rely on statistical mechanics, which is quantum mechanics. 
Um, if you add in the very reasonable assumption that if there exist these hidden variables, that they can only be influenced by things in their past light cone, meaning uh, things in their lo local vicinity, uh, then you get uh, local hidden variables, which is an example of local realism. And this relates very directly to the idea of trying to certify a random number generator. So this is an example that's sometimes used as a good random number generator. You have photons that hit a beam splitter, 50-50 beam splitter, and then you can go to one or two detectors. And the question is, is this good? Should you trust this? Well, if you believe quantum mechanics and you believe quantum mechanics that there's some kind of randomness to this process, then yes, you might think this is a good random number generator. But you have to make a lot of assumptions about the device. For example, who knows? Maybe this isn't actually a 50-50 beam splitter. Maybe what's really going on is that this beam splitter is just switching deterministically and sending photons to either this detector or this detector based on whether the next digit of pi what this beam splitter or this, this system is doing. And um, it gets worse than this. Like maybe, maybe quantum mechanics isn't right. Maybe there is a local hidden variable model that could be describing this. And uh, in the most disastrous scenario, you, th these local hidden variables are hidden from you, but some unknown hacker or eavesdropper actually has access to them and can use them to exactly predict what the system does. And giving a hacker all of the power of a local realistic theory, so they have all the tools available that a local um, realism would, uh, you, can, you can actually use a Bell test to try and rule that out, because a Bell test is a test of local realism. And in 1964, John Bell showed that any such local realistic theory would have to be fundamentally incompatible with the predictions of quantum mechanics. And in Bell's own words, he says, but if a hidden variable theory is local, it will not agree with quantum mechanics. And if it agrees with quantum mechanics, it will not be local. This is what the theorem says. So, little digression. I, I really like this, uh, this diagram, sometimes called a fine diagram. It shows the, the strength of correlations between two particles. So if, with local realism, this box here represents the kind of strength of the maximum amount of correlations that this, this theory would allow between two particles. With quantum mechanics, you can have correlations that are stronger. And with a PR box, this represents the kind of maximal amount of correlations that you're, you're allowed to have in, in systems. And we, we believe, we, I think many of us would believe we live in this kind of quantum region, that the world was governed by something in here. And it's these slightly stronger correlations over local realism that really allow us um, all of the power of many of our new quantum technologies that we're trying to develop, like quantum computing and so on. It's exploiting that. So our test is, we know that in local realism, um, the correlations are not as strong as those that you'd expect with quantum mechanics. So we can devise what's known as a Bell test where you have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they're going to measure correlations and see if they're consistent with the predictions of local realism. So you've got um, here a source. In our case, it's going to be sending photons uh, to Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob will be measuring the polarization states of the photons that they receive. Alice has two measurement settings, A and A prime, two polarization measurement settings that she can switch between randomly with her, the random number generator. And Bob, same thing, has two settings, B and B prime, different polarization states. And they have detectors where they can see if they, if they get a click or not each trial of the experiment. And at the end of the experiment, they're going to see if the, the mutual correlations of their settings and outcome choices, uh, if those correlations are stronger than what local realism allows. But as Ronald already pointed out, this is not the entirety of the story because you have to add in a few extra conditions to truly rule out this local realism. And the first is what we call the locality condition, right? Uh, you want to make sure that things, these hidden variables can only be influenced by things in their past light cone. So you want to make sure that Alice and Bob, that they are really dependent of one another. And so you can do this by moving them far enough apart such that any information about Alice's setting or outcome doesn't have time to leak over to Bob um, before he's completed his measurement 
and vice versa. You don't want any information about Bob's settings or outcomes to leak over to Alice. So by moving them far enough apart, you can ensure that um, they, you know, signals going at the speed of light don't have time to propagate. Second is, and this is quite important, uh, freedom, sometimes called freedom of choice, but Alice and Bob really need to be able to uh, be able to make their measurement decisions independent. And if, if somehow the source is able to correlate to Alice and Bob's random number generators or predict what their settings are going to be, it's game over. You can't do this protocol at all. And finally, uh, uh, for the kind of physical assumptions, you you have to detect at least two-thirds of the particles that you receive. Um, this is kind of like if we play a, a statistics game that we're playing here. So if I imagine, for example, we're going to play a coin game. So uh, I have a coin, and I tell you I think it's highly biased towards heads. And we're going to bet on this. You, you say it's fair. And I go off, and I flip the coin 100 times, and I come back to you, and I say, you know, I'm really sorry. I flipped the coin 100 times. I completely forgot to record some of the trials. Um, you know, I randomly dropped some of the trials, but I ended up recording 47 trials, 47 of the results, and I got 47 heads. Please pay me the money. Should you believe me? No. Now, if I've really been honest with you and my decision to discard a trial is independent of its result, then yes, that is a fair sample. The coin is probably biased. But you don't necessarily want to rely on my, my, uh, how honest I am on this. And the same thing for the statistical test. You have to detect at least two-thirds of the particles that you see. And finally, as Ronald mentioned, you also need to make sure that in your analysis of those correlations, you don't end up um, introducing any accidental um, other loopholes that could exist. So these conditions for, say, when you're going to a device-independent uh, model and you're trying to rule out a hacker with all the power of local realism, uh, really these come down to the kind of standard cryptographic assumptions that you have to make in every single setup. If you give your hacker access to Alice and Bob's equipment and complete access to it, it's game over. You can't, you can't do cryptography or key exchange or anything else. So you have to assume some kind of physical security around Alice and Bob and that somehow this, the hacker isn't able to correlate to random number generators, or you know, come in and replace the memory on your hard drive with pre-computed bits and things like that. But what's nice is if you can make that, ass that assumption of physical security, which I think is reasonable, um, and you satisfy these other conditions, then you don't have to worry about the device physics so much about what's going on in here, uh, because you, you don't have to worry about those kind of sign channels during the experiment. And what what excites me about this is, in our particular setup, I'm not as worried about a hacker, per se. I think the biggest danger to this experiment is myself as an experimentalist. I am the biggest threat that I'm going to do something stupid accidentally and open up some unknown side channel. And what this does is uh, it allows me, with a minimal set of assumptions, to test against that. And I've got this, uh, I love this example, one of my co-authors, Morgan Mitchell, he tells the story of he set up a, a Bell test experiment for undergraduates in a lab. So undergraduates could come in and do this experiment. It worked beautifully. In fact, it worked so well, when you turned off the laser, you continued to violate a Bell inequality. <laughs> what was happening was the detectors, one of the detectors, uh, would get these dark counts. And whenever it would trigger these dark counts, it would emit a flash, and then that photon would propagate through the system and then be detected by the other detector. And just because of the way it was going through the setup and through the polarizers, it would end up with the right polarization correlations to violate a Bell inequality. Right? So if you had moved everything far apart, you wouldn't have to worry about this. You wouldn't see it. And there's so many different possible ways that you can fool yourself that this is a nice way to kind of get rid of most of that. So it's not perfect, but it's about as best as you can with nature. And if you can do this and violate a Bell inequality, then you can turn this into a certificate on the kind of amount of randomness that you extract. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is our actual setup for the experiment. Oh, we, we would love to have had everything just in a nice straight line with the source in the middle and Alice and Bob. 
Uh, it turns out that people are much more difficult to work with than photons. And you can't just go in and start demanding people move their offices um, so you can set up this experiment and these noisy fridges and equipment. So instead, uh, we had a lab here with the source and a lab here with Bob. And we managed to beg, borrow, and partially steal some space over in this room over here at NIST. And we, this triangle configuration, it's a little bit more complicated, but we can still satisfy all of the requirements for um, the loophole-free bell test. I'm going to go through that in a moment. Uh, here is the actual kind of like building layout and see where the rooms are located and the kind of distances that are involved. So they're, they're fairly far apart. In the source, we generate entangled photon pairs. Uh, it turns out because we don't have perfect efficiency, then you don't want to use a maximally entangled state. It's actually optimal to violate the inequalities. You can do much better if you use these kind of non-maximally entangled states. And this was optimal um, for our system. And we produce our photons through a process of something called spontaneous parametric down conversion. We have these strong pump pulses that come in. They hit a crystal. And then sometimes about one in a thousand of those pulses will fission into a pair of daughter photons. And you can arrange things such that these photons are polarization entangled with one another. So we spent a long time trying to build the source up to get it to be very highly efficient. And it turns out that our, our detectors are about 90% efficient. We use these special custom superconducting nanowire detectors that we developed at NIST. And so they have about 90% efficiency. And that allows us to get a total system heralding efficiency of about 75%. That's including multiple couplings in and out of fibers. So that was very challenging to do. And for our setup, we need to have more than 72.5% total system detection efficiency, not two thirds, because we have noise in our detectors. So we have to, this is actually the kind of bound that we need to cross in order to, to violate any So I'm going to actually show you kind of a, a kind of diagram of what's going on with our experiment, a little animation. So at t equals zero, a pair of photons are born. And as you saw, they travel out and they have to kind of go along these fiber optic cables that are strung up in the hallway. They're traveling at two thirds the speed of light because they're in glass. However, information from the source, right? You could imagine if that's leaking information, that information is traveling at the speed of light and it's going along this kind of direct line of sight. So uh, these light cones are representing information. In the source. And after about 332 nanoseconds, Bob starts to pick his random number. So at each station, Alice and Bob, they each have three random number generators. Two of them are based on physical hardware, and that's what's starting. And the third is based on pseudo-random bits um, that have been computed from movies and television shows that have been XORed together with physical constants. And so Bob starts to pick his random number. And about 50 nanoseconds later, he finishes picking his random number. And he finishes it before any information from the source could possibly reach him and influence that, that decision. At the same time, information about his settings choice has now started to leak out and is headed towards Alice. And Alice has to receive her photon, measure it, and record that result before this light code can reach there. So we're in kind of a race. Uh, because of the geometry of the system, at this point, Alice's random number generator starts. She starts hers a little bit later because of the kind of extra fiber that exists over here to kind of compensate for that. And 50 nanoseconds later, she finishes her random number, like picking it. And she does so before any information from the source can arrive. And so we can say that the freedom of choice is closed, that the Alice and Bob, their measurement decisions are independent of the source. Now, what happens is the photon arrives, and Alice has to complete her measurement before this light cone is up there. Here's what actually happens in the Alice's setup. We have a fiber optic cable. We couple the light out of the fiber, and it goes through this device called a pockel cell that allows us to quite rapidly switch between two different polarization settings. So Alice can make two different polarization measurements. We couple back into fiber, and then we send this to our single photon so sometime later, the measurement's actually complete. What do I mean by that? Well, that fiber, uh, it goes into this cryostat. Here's the superconducting nanowire detectors. They're cooled down to about 700 millikelvin. And we detect the photons. 
then that signal comes up, is amplified into a classical pulse, and it's recorded by this time tagger, and we say the measurement's complete once that signal reaches the time tagger itself. And if you notice, it's complete before this light cone, any information from Bob setting, has had time to reach itself. So that's good. Al Bob cannot influence Alice's measurement. Same situation over here. The photon arrives at Bob. Bob has to finish it before any information from Alice's setting can arrive. And so he has a similar type of pockel cell and he couples fiber, goes through the polarization measurement, couples back into fiber. And then he's able to complete his measurement in the same way with a similar single photon nanowire detector that gets amplified and sent to a time tagger. And he's able to complete his measurement before any information from Alice can reach. And so we can ensure that these locality, the locality loophole is closed. And actually through very careful measurement of all the different components in the device, we have an extremely high degree of confidence in, in how well we've done that. It's much, much higher than say a seven sigma um, level of confidence. So Ronald mentioned that um, not a lot of people understand what a p-value is, and that's been my experience too. And a couple years ago, I was also very ignorant of what p-values were. So here's the kind of model. Like if, you, if you're doing like a CHSH inequality, a lot like what Ronald or Harold do, um, then if you're familiar with it, you're, you understand that the correlations that you can observe, this kind of bell parameter, uh, the, the maximum value for a local realistic theory is two. For quantum mechanics, it's two root two, and anything beyond that is kind of you're in Pierre box land where you have very, very strong correlations. And what we do is we, we often measure from these inequalities of values, say like two and a half for say a CHSH. And the question that we want to answer is what is the closest or the probability that a local realistic theory could have produced a value that's equal to what you observe or greater? And that kind of area under the curve, that's, that's your p-value. That's what you're actually measuring with this. And so there's been a lot of work that's been done by a number of different groups that are based on these kind of martingale approaches um, for analyzing a bell inequality that get away from making any assumptions about independence and every trial being independent and identical. Um, so this is the kind of hypothesis. You're ruling out the hypothesis that local realism is consistent with data. In our experiment, we actually have to use a different inequality. We use inequality, a modified form of it, this feature. And most of our trials that we do, in our experiment we do about 132 million trials, but most of them are empty. And that's because our probability of producing a pair of photons is so low. Each time we try to produce it, we have about a one in a thousand chance. But empty trials don't actually come into this inequality. And so we don't actually have to, um, they don't contribute to the violation, but you can't discard them. But because we have so many trials, the magnitude of our actual violation is extremely small. It's very close to the boundary. But we can take so many trials and get such good statistics that we can still rule out the probability of a local realistic theory influencing our results with um, a very high confidence. That's much greater than five sigma. And at the same time, you would think that a hacker with all the tools of local realism, we could you know, rule out that hacker's influence on our setup. Uh, so we went and we looked at some of the um, state-of-the-art uh, randomness extraction protocols, particularly the one from Peronio in um, 2013, and uh, we were able to extract exactly zero bits from our system. Now, this is mostly because this protocol is specifically fine-tuned towards a CHSH inequality, which we're not performing, and also to uh, a type of experiment more like Ronald or Harold Weinfurters that have this kind of event-ready um, system. In our case, because we have so many of these null trials that are uh, just giving zeros a lot of the time, uh, this, this protocol fails. We would have to take about two orders of magnitude more data just to get a single bit of violation. So instead, we, uh, Peter Beerhorst spent a long time trying to develop a new technique to extract randomness that's better suited to our experiment. And Peter will talk more about that on uh, tomorrow in the Hot Topics session, but here's kind of a, a little preview of that. Uh, the, the way we do this is we, we imagine for a second um, that we have some hacker here, uh, randomly picked from the audience members. Uh, 
And this hacker wants to figure out how our system works. And let's just assume for a moment that we live in some sort of magical universe that's governed by PR boxes. And the hacker's job is to be able to come up with a predictable model for what's happening. And if our system's really governed by a PR box, then what that means is that this hacker has some kind of access, access to hidden variables that govern the system. So they, they can look at the hidden variables and they can exactly predict the outputs of the PR box. However, a consequence of doing that is that is such a powerful resource that any hacker that can, that can have that kind of access could use those variables to then communicate faster than the speed of light. They could signal deterministically. So if we make the very reasonable assumption that we live in a universe that prohibits no signaling, that you cannot send information faster than the speed of light, then any such variables that underlie the, the physics of the system of a PR box that a hacker could access, they must be fundamentally random. So there exists, uh, like anything that's governed by this PR box, you, know, you can't predict what's going on in the way that you would like to for a device model. So what we do is we rewrite our inequality and we say that maybe we live in a universe or experiment is governed um, not by quantum mechanics, but it's governed by some theory, this is our new hypothesis, that most of the trials follow local realism, the bulk of them, but some small fraction are governed by PR boxes. And that's going to allow stronger correlations than what quantum mechanics, or than local realism by itself allows, but we can derive a new, we can modify our inequality to, instead of testing for this boundary, test for this boundary, and we can rule out um, a theory that contains this percentage of PR boxes, and those trials that are governed by like a PR box would have to be fundamentally random. There is that randomness there. So a hacker in the worst case scenario could use all the information of a local realistic theory to exactly predict this fraction of how that experiment works, but this, ax this part here is like that, that kernel of good nugget of randomness. And we can, we can certify that with this kind of p-value since the boundary moves over, the p-value uh, gets, gets larger, so we don't have as much confidence. But in our experiment that we did, we can extract up to 512 bits with a p-value of about um, you know, 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So it's a, it's a pretty good certificate that we have at least this much um, randomness in our system. And there's more to the story. You, you actually need to then take this. This is just a certificate on how much randomness is in this string, and it's have to go and extract that. It's a little bit like taking you know, a wet sponge and squeezing it out. You, know, you want to squeeze out the randomness from your data. So you need to use a classical extractor. Uh, Peter's going to talk a little bit about the work of using a classical Trevisan extractor to then um, take those 512 bits. You get less out, but it's still about the same order of magnitude. We didn't just do one experiment run, experimental run. We actually did a whole bunch of different experimental runs. You can read about them in our paper. Uh, but we, we had two special blind data sets that we took. So we didn't record any information about what was going on in the setup. We just ran it. Uh, we kept those on a shelf like a nice wine. And uh, about a month ago, we kind of cracked those open. And we've also applied our randomness protocols to those. And so uh, Peter will be talking about those results as well. So if you want to go and analyze our data, uh, you, can, you can do so here. And there's get access to all of it. Uh, just be warned that there's a lot of data, um, so be prepared with like a couple terabytes of hard drive space, but you can, you can access it. And what, our, uh, what I've been doing recently is in the lab, um, we really want to develop a system that can be integrated into our beacon. And so the first run that we did last year was really kind of a, a calibration run for trying to figure out how the system works. Uh, right now, we want to be getting to the regime where we can produce on the order of like 500 to 1,000 bits per minute. And so I'm working right now to improve our, and I'm pretty close to having achieved this, of improving the rate by about a factor of 100, so two orders of magnitude. I think for the third generation, we can get maybe another order or two beyond this, so we'd be able to generate quite high bit rates. And finally, um, these systems, like, all of these bell tests are, are kind of minor miracles in technology themselves, and um, they're extremely, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of work to keep them running over a long period of time. So I'm trying to improve the robustness of it so it actually can be more of a module 
that we can use. So um, I'd just like to end with three advertisements. I've already advertised Peter's talk tomorrow, um, the hot topics. If you would like to see our Bell test set up, then next summer is the perfect opportunity because NIST and Boulder were hosting the single photon workshop, so I highly recommend you come. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some great things planned, um, so I please, please uh, consider coming to this workshop and taking a look at my actual setup. And finally, we're looking for experimental postdocs, so if you're interested in coming, working at NIST and working on this type of stuff, then please contact me or send me. Thank you. Okay, is the mic on? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the uh, random bit generation. Um, because for the bell cast, you also have the input random bits, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just wondering, right? Um, would you be inputting more random bits that you are generating in the end? So that you have to erase the random numbers? I mean, no, we're, we, 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 we're doing like a, in this case, we, we used about 132 million trials. So it's like 132 million input bits, and from that we extracted 512. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's not. Um, we're not doing any kind of amplification. Wait, but but in the bell cast, don't you have the input random bits in Google cast, and can not you be using more random bits in the input than what you actually finally generate? Yes, well, absolutely. But we we don't care so much about those uh, the random number generators that Alice and Bob. In some sense, you don't care about how good they are. You just care that they're not correlated to what a hacker has or a source. And so, you know, they don't have to be that great. They could just be some pseudo-random bits that, as long as the hacker doesn't know about them, and that's an assumption you have to make, then, then you can use that to actually generate good random bits that you can certify. So we're interested in trying to use all of our resources at our capability to produce certifiable random bits. Thanks, very nice talk and experiment. I do have one major reservation, um, which is that in, in, in your, all your nice animated drawings, crucial at some point that measurement is complete. Yes. Now, my problem is that, as far as I know, standard quantum theory does not give us any information as to when that happens. And according to some interpretations, some interpretations it never happens, actually. So how can you be so confident that at these particular points in time, measurements are complete? So you, you, strictly speaking, you can't. You have to draw a line somewhere. And for, for us, um, I think it's reasonable to say, you know, the, the time when this very macroscopic measurable signal has been recorded, you can maybe resort to thermodynamics arguments that uh, the entropy in the system has now been increased quite dramatically. Um, to be honest, if, if that wasn't the case, and somehow Alice and Bob's computer memories could be entangled with one another, that would be fantastic. I mean, we, we now have an entangled quantum memory in a classical scale. Like, then, like, that's an even more exciting result, in my opinion. So, you know, I, I think we can only win at this point. 